what we've all been waiting for for a long, long time. The longest offseason in all of sports is over. The Hawkeyes back on the field against Utah State coming up on a Saturday. Of course, this is Hawkeyes Live right here at the Boys of College Football for a 108th edition. Corey Bratta from the Hawkeye of the Storm, of course, is the guy that makes this go for us. And we got Elliot Klo from the rival site for Iowa Football, basketball, athletics, uh, joining us as well. Elliot, it's great to see you. Thanks for joining us tonight. Yeah, thanks for having me on, uh, on Mark. And uh, yes, Clough, like rough and tough. Oh, my bad. Yeah, you're good. <laughs> no problem. <laughs> I should be able to digest that. Okay, got it. Clough, <laughs> Elliot's joining us uh, for the show today. And of course, Corey makes it go. And uh, join uh, he and Coach Don Patterson. I believe you just uh, released a season preview. Yeah, season preview with Coach P recorded last night, dropped today, so that's that'll be fun uh, for people to watch if they haven't already. We've got Brad Heinrichs coming on a live show tomorrow night, and uh, season preview I think dropping later today. I could probably Elliot's in a very similar position, albeit different type of content where you're kind of in a race against time. Mark and I have been talking about this for weeks on end now about how you're trying to figure out how to schedule everything and get everything out and get what you need done done. And now you're battling. I don't know if you want to talk about this, Elliot, but you're you're battling something else during game week. Right. Yeah, that's uh, no problem. Just got diagnosed with COVID. So uh, we're, we're having a good time here. Luckily, started experiencing symptoms on Saturday last week. So um, should be good to end quarantine starting tomorrow. Um, and, and I'm feeling feeling fine. You know, I'm I'm surviving. Obviously, you can tell I'm a little stuffed up. But other than that, uh, we're doing great. And, you know, Corey, throw in recruiting in there for me as well as a recruiting analyst at, at Rivals. And I know you're doing those those uh, those videos as well at, at, at Hawkeye of the Storm doing a great Great job. So uh, a whole lot of things going on. Really excited about this weekend. Going to go head out and watch uh, Derek Weisskopf in Williamsburg take on uh, Xavier in, in Cedar Rapids. So that's going to be a really fun game as well. So a whole lot going on right now, but uh, enjoying every second of it. And hopefully we'll be healthy this weekend. Yeah, so your, your plan, for anybody that doesn't know, Elliot was not at the uh, the uh, press conference today with Kirk Ferentz. So that's that's good. So <laughs> there won't be, <laughs> yeah. there won't be uh, any major uh, game day issues related to uh, go Iowa awesome and Iowa rivals. But uh, Elliot, I'm just before we, and I know Mark has a few comments. He, he watched Kirk Ferentz's presser as did I today. And we can, I, I do want to get your thoughts on, on the latest with Iowa football recruiting. I know you're, you're really tuned into that. And in case anybody doesn't know, you've, you've been covering football for quite some time. This is your first year in the Iowa beat, but you were up, uh, up the road, up at Northern Iowa uh, previously. So we can maybe talk a little bit about your background, but Right now, uh, you know, we're, what, four games out from kickoff. Uh, it's supposed to be like 93, 94 degrees on Saturday. Um, I, I asked Don Patterson, was recording the show last night, do you remember a game that eclipsed 100 degrees? Like, it's going to be over 100 degrees on the field. There's no question about that with that turf. Uh, and they're wearing black uniforms. But I, I don't remember the last time um, – that there was a game this hot. I think back to maybe 2014, 2015, they played, I think Northern Illinois or Miami, Ohio, one of those Illinois schools or Midwest schools, I should say. And it was really hot. And I had a friend pass out on the way back to the car. That's the last time I remember a game this hot. The humidity is going to be insane. I know we want to talk about football, but that's just, that's on my mind right now, Mark, because I'll be at that game. I will not be in the press box covering it formally. I'll be in the stands with everybody else sweating their tails off. So, um, they got that AC cranking in the press box, Elliot. Is that the, uh, I know you haven't covered I, a game up there yet, but. Right. Well, I, I've covered the spring game and then, um, this, this kid's day game, but, uh, they, they definitely had the AC working at the kid's day. I don't know. I think I stopped by and said to you, I'm sunburnt. I'm over this. And I went back up into the, the press box at the, at the kid's day game. So, uh, yeah, I'm definitely, definitely happy about that. Yeah, but and, might, be the uh, one, know, might be the one week where I'd, I'd endorse a Utah state night game but we're not going to get that mark and with the press box and the positioning of the sun it's a sold out game i think there are going to be a lot of tickets on the marketplace probably leading up to to 11 a.m on saturday for fans that want to get a, a last second trip to, to iowa city and to kinnick but uh if you haven't been to kinnick for a while remember that press box you really don't get any shade from that press box for a, an 11 a.m kick unless you're way up against that press box maybe by fourth quarter so basically everybody's going to be absolutely toasted um, I have not heard in the past Iowa has made like I remember one year is at 15 or 16 somewhere in there. They actually were handing out free waters. Um, I think at a recent 
uh, season opener, Mark, they actually made like they it was really, really hot. And so this handing out waters, they just promoted the sales of waters. <laughs> I believe so. So I guess uh, people will, d- you know, people are going to be tailgating earlier because it'll be cooler in the day. Um, there's not a cloud. And we looked last night during our show with Don and I'm like looking at the seven day forecast. There's not a single cloud in the seven day forecast. <laughs> so Just beating sun with those black uniforms. And Don did make an interesting point to me as well. He said when he coached, he always thought, especially when he was coaching at Iowa, he always thought it was an advantage when it was a hot, sunny day and an advantage for the the road team, especially when the home team wears black. And I made the comment a couple of years ago when Iowa went to Iowa State and the Cyclones chose to wear their stupid black uniforms during the middle of the day at Jack Trice. Didn't need to, decided to. Of course, lost. Not going to blame it on that. But uh, I, I guarantee you they won't do that again. I almost feel like Iowa needs to have an, a permanent alternate home uniform for September games because it is. I mean, these guys are going to be – can you imagine, Mark, how hot it's going to be on the field? Not not to mention uh, in in, pa- in black uniforms, pads, helmet. I mean, it's going to be insane. And obviously they have cooling fans and all that nonsense. So uh, anyways, um, where do you want to start with this, Mark? Do you want to start with Cade McNamara? I know you have comments on – Kirk's comments regarding the offense yeah, and his my philosophy. comments are certainly secondary. We've got Elliot here. We want to hear from, from Elliot. Uh, let's lead into uh Cade McNamara. It sounds like, it sounds like he's going to start, but there's not a commitment to him starting. And there's an understanding that he's not a hundred percent. He's nowhere near a hundred percent, but as long as, and it seems like the determination has come back from the medical staff that he's most likely not going to, uh, further the injury it's just going to be a soreness issue and a pain threshold issue and as long as it's not altering his throwing then he's going to be out there is that how you perceive yeah. this Elliot? yeah you know I, truthfully i think what this is is kurt continuing to keep it keep it in a shroud of mystery Ooh, who's going to play what's going to happen because that's his mo right if there's any sort of advantage or any sort of mystery they're going to keep it a mystery as long as possible personally i think Cade's going to be fine good to play i don't think they would have posted him on social media however long ago that was a couple days ago i think it was saturday yeah. um if there was no chance he was going to play if they were really just saying hey we're not sure what's going to happen and then not play him and use that as a shroud to not play him. They wouldn't have posted him on, on social media. I don't think they would have anyway. I think he's got, I think, I think he's got to play. I, I think it's, it's a done deal. I, the, I don't think we're going to see Deacon Hill at all. And the coy, the coy approach I saw, Kate, and, and this is not a rip on KCCI, but KCCI released that little clip a week ago, Elliot. You probably saw that. I don't even know what that was, where the interview was taking place, but it was the oddest clip from a state television media company that i've ever seen off of an interview with cade where he it was almost like kcci was trying to stir the pot like it was it was one of those they had she asked the uh, reporter asked cade about his injury and cade was like super evasive uh i'm not going to comment on that or blah and it's like that was supposed to stir the pot but like you said he was seen at practice uh on saturday he's out there with the media what reason does i've said this for so long and now with the new rule that we can talk about mark the Big Ten over the past week has instituted this new rule, a lot of it surrounding the betting stuff, but Big Ten teams have to announce availability prior to kickoff. So, like I've always said, why why tip your cap on guys when you're releasing a depth chart on Monday? Why do that? Um, or, or why tip your cap during your weekly press conference, whether that's on Monday, Tuesday, or Wednesday? And now with that availability thing, I, I think there's even less of an onus on coaches, including Kirk Ferentz, to be real transparent and certainly why does Cade McNamara need to spoil that to Utah state? There are a lot of unknowns in these season openers more so than in a typical year. Kirk brought it up today. The transfer portal has changed so much with scouting teams. And I wouldn't be surprised Mark, if we see some week one upsets uh, that maybe we didn't expect because uh, again, even at the G five level, there are so many different people moving around that we don't typically see. I just don't think there's any reason to, to uh, from a gamesmanship standpoint, I don't think there's any reason to tip your cap before Saturday when when you have to submit those reports. I did think on the depth chart, and I said this to Coach Patterson yesterday, I did think the depth chart was curious in that 
it's like I I couldn't locate anybody. Maybe you're Elliot. You you can comment on this as well. I didn't see anybody on that depth chart that like I, I didn't notice anybody missing. There wasn't a single guy. Um, typically at this time of year, I mean, just think about the wide receiver position a year ago. Nico Ragaini and uh, Deontay Vines were both out last year, and that's just one position. There wasn't a single guy listed as out. Dejon Parker's listed as back. You've got your receivers, your your uh, scholarship guys up there healthy. Every offensive lineman that we expected to be in the rotation is listed on the two deeps, and every defensive lineman minus Noah Shannon, who we expected to be on the two deeps, is is listed there. So it's some, it, it, there's two parts to that. either they got they stayed really healthy throughout fall camp, and I do think that's part of it, or B, this might just be Kirk's way of saying I'm not going to be. I'm not going to, I'm going to put even less stock into what we release on Mondays. That would be maybe my conspiracy theory on this. Do you, you agree with that, Elliot? Yeah. You know, I, I think there are, I think there are two things to, to take away in regards. And I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm just going to regurgitate what you just said, Corey, is that, well, didn't Kirk say today that he felt like this is the healthiest they've been yeah, through he did this make the point in camp. Yeah. So, so there's that. And then two, I, I think the point you made before we even hopped on regarding the the keeping things um, quiet in terms of how they they operate with the two deeps and keeping it, I don't know, uh, in, in a shroud of mystery, to, to quote myself earlier, is the way they're going to operate and not release things uh, to the public or, or to essentially to opposing teams any later than they are any earlier than they have to. And so I don't I don't think that this is necessarily a it's tough to look at the depth chart with Kirk Ferentz anyway and say this is the way it's going to be on Saturday I'm positive that's the way it's going to be and now it's even more so well now I have no idea and and you throw in the the comments on Kate well now I really have no idea I mean the offensive line do you think Nick DeYoung is the best guy to start for them at left guard I would have thought it'd be Rusty Feth I mean and uh, we're not I, there. That was something I, I commented on Twitter. We're not. I, We're not there. How can we day. really? Yeah, I know people hate <laughs> and I people hate Nick DeYoung. I don't know why. I mean, I feel bad for Nick DeYoung. He's a Pella. He's a Central Iowa kid, and yep. I feel bad for him because he's really kind of an enemy of the fan base. But Kirk has raved about his versatility along that offensive line. I've said before, Elliot. I think Dejon Parker, based on what I've seen, and I'm no old line expert. I think Dejon Parker is the most natural right tackle they have at their disposal. But Kirk has talked about how he's been behind now he i was told he returned here a couple weeks ago but he's behind right now jennings dunker is the guy at right tackle and kirk said that's going to stay that way i think i made the comment yesterday too i think ideally they can move parker uh to maybe your starting right tackle spot by the end of the year dunker moves inside and maybe he takes you know they got so many people they can rotate in at guard it's just who's going to be effective and and i would think that competition should only make the interior of that line Better, but I agree with Elliot. I think Cade's going to play, Mark, and they are. As Jerry Denardo made that comment when when Big Ten Network visited Iowa here a couple weeks ago, he made the comment that there weren't many guys quote on the ground, which was an indication to him that this might be a more athletic team than we've seen in past years. So I am encouraged by that. I think again, be balanced with our outlook on what Kirk says on Tuesdays during the year, especially early in the year, and with the depth chart releases on Monday. And then we'll pay close attention to what happens Saturday. The other thing we didn't see on the depth chart, and Kirk's not saying anything about it during his Tuesday availability, is we don't know who else is possibly going to be unavailable due to suspension surrounding that betting investigation. Um, Elliot, I'm sure you've heard some names. I've heard a couple of names that have not been released, and apparently those players have not given Kirk permission to talk about uh, their suspensions. Um, There was nobody, again, nobody that was missing on the depth chart. So unless these are guys that, uh, you know, there are a couple guys that, that were expected to be rotation players that I had heard were involved that were possibly facing suspensions. Kirk didn't even, he was asked today, will those names be on the availability report Saturday morning? And he said, he didn't know it's all a new, it's a new rule. So I understand him not knowing, (laughs) but it will be very intriguing to see around nine o'clock in the morning, what we get with that availability report. Um, And, you know, the other thing about the availability report, Mark, and I haven't studied that up, up, you know, up and down, but I'm guessing that 
it's sort of a formality in that if they want to list guys as questionable, they can just list guys as questionable. And there's no definitive answer to people. It's it's isn't that kind of how the NFL works with availability reports? You, you don't yeah, have to that, say a guy's playing or not. That coming out so close to kickoff, though, uh, I would think that you would have to be pretty transparent about that, because if you list somebody as being available and then they're sitting on the sideline and then you get questioned after the game, why are they just why did they not play then? Well, what I'm saying is if you list a guy as questionable and he goes through warmups, he, he, after the warmups, he's either ready or he's not. How can you, I don't know how you could punish a head coach for listing a guy as questionable, regardless of what actually happens. Game time decision, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I mean, yeah, I don't remember that umpteen times. That. Sure. It doesn't eliminate that facet of, of the game. So I don't know. Yeah. We'll, we'll see. I think it's good for the sport based on some of the, the struggles with the, with the betting investigations sure. and whatnot. And I have no issue with it. And whether it's the depth chart that's released earlier or it's this transparency report or whatever, it's availability report that's uh, released a couple hours before kickoff, who's keeping anyone accountable? If that depth chart is a mess and it's nothing close to the, you know, if if I'm a head coach, you know, I'm listing all the obvious starters that everyone knows. And if I've got, let's say, three positions on each side of the ball that are up in the air, I'm just randomly selecting who the starter, the so-called first line of the depth chart is the starter, uh, because I also don't want to be accused of or rival coaches picking up on that I always place the, the guy that's not going to be the starter on the second or the first line. And so I just kind of randomly throw guys uh, that are battling for a job uh, on the first and second lines. But But who's holding anyone accountable for how accurate this depth chart is? or this report that's going to come out before kickoff. That's why I've never understood even last year, there were times where uh, injuries occur. And I understand there's a, a facet of sportsmanship and there's always been kind of an unwritten rule of being honest with those, with those releases, I guess. But why ever, I just have never understood why teams have, if there's not a rule in place, why tip your cap to injuries early in the week? It, it makes no sense. Um, so anyways, um, we can get off that subject. I, I just figured it was it was worth bringing up because I, I do think they're healthier than normal. I mean, all indications are that they are healthy. And we saw most guys at Kids Day, and the guys we didn't see, Elliot, Nico Ragaini, Cooper DeGene, Cade McNamara, all those guys are back. We've seen them practicing, and we were all told basically that day that they were healthy. Jeremiah Pittman, Kirk brought him up today. He wasn't at Kids Day. He was at a wedding. So, like, they're healthy, and... Minus Noah Shannon, we don't know of anyone else specifically that is out due to anything, suspension, injury, whatever. Uh, there's probably going to be a couple other guys. By the way, in case people missed it, Aaron Blom, Jack Johnson, both off the roster. Neither one of them are listed on the roster now. So that is, I mean, what not unexpected, but it is uh, kind of a culmination of, of what we expected and what we've seen over the last month transpire with the criminal charges against both those guys. Uh, so they're... I think by all accounts, their career it has not been stated by Kirk Ferentz, but their careers at Iowa are done. And I think their college football careers are done. They're also walk-ons. So it's not like they're these valuable commodities that I hate to say that. I know that sounds bad. We're talking about a couple of Iowa kids, but they bet on their own team and uh, can't do that. So they're off the roster, according to the latest uh, information out there. And uh, Utah State comes knocking, Mark. Uh, they had a dual threat guy. Quarterback Kirk, I know, has a lot of respect for for the Aggies and their head coach, whose name escapes me. You can probably tell me what it is, Mark. Yeah, Blake Anderson won yeah. five consecutive or shared one outright or shared five consecutive Sun Belt Conference titles at Arkansas State. He's an exceptional football coach, and as Kirk alluded to, I don't think he really defined it, but uh, when he came to Utah State, they were in shambles. And uh, they were one of the biggest turnarounds in college football two years ago with 11 wins. They had a decent season last year getting to a bowl game. But so they're going to be a capable outfit showing up uh, for this game. Uh, I, I thought it was kind of interesting that uh, in true Iowa fashion, Utah State's got a player that blocked three punts uh, last year. One single guy. So uh, Kirk said that uh, they're going to be on the lookout for him on the, on the film. Can change the game, right? I mean, I would. I know that sounds stupid and cliche, and you don't like those discussions, Mark, about uh, punting is winning and how. But 
Tory Taylor is such an important part of this football team. Imagine if they get an early. I don't mind those block. discussions. It could be like seven to three in the fourth quarter. You know, could you imagine that? I can imagine that without if, even scoring a touchdown. Maybe I'll tell you what. I can, three in the fourth <laughs> I can imagine if if this is going to scare some fans if they care at all what I say. Uh, if Cade doesn't play, I will be surprised if Iowa eclipses the 25 point mark, even against Utah state. I'm serious about that because I still don't, ha I, I have hope this offensive line as the year goes on will become adequate, capable. And I know Kirk's high on them, but I think it's going to take a few games. And I, I just, I don't have a whole lot of faith in Deacon Hill. Uh, Corey, I'll scare them more. I agree with you. If they care what I say, <laughs> you know, like I, I think it's a fair statement given the offensive line, given the newness of the the weapons. I mean, Caleb Brown, obviously, Seth Anderson, Eric, all these guys are talented. But if you don't have your starting quarterback, the trajectory of the offense was awful last year. You bring some new pieces in on the offensive line. Neither of them going to start, you know, all these factors, a quarterback who hasn't taken a snap. But at least I was got a, a play caller that everybody has faith in. <laughs> I mean, seriously, I'm not, I'm not ripping Ryan, right, but I'm just saying, like, <laughs> the other variable, well, you got great coaching. No, you don't. <laughs> if not, if history serves us correctly, I mean, let's call a spade a spade. Uh, Mark, I gotta, I gotta, I'll be right back. So, Elliot, uh, talking about that, there were two aspects. I don't know if you caught this uh, during the uh, press conference today, but uh, you're, you're certainly well aware covering this team from day to day. Kirk is really high on the offensive line, and – states hey we're so much more experienced than we were at this point last year where you're so much more confident pointed to a few guys that were basically just trying to survive at this point last year that actually uh, needed significant playing time and uh seth anderson was a guy that he kind of highlighted as being somebody that uh, could be a go-to guy Yeah, yeah, Seth Anderson, uh, we saw it in at, at Kids Day. Um, he is a guy that really produced big time last year at, of course, FCS, Charleston, Charleston Southern, um, and stepped in, and I think he adds, you know, of course, we've talked and we've heard a lot about the, the offensive line growth in terms of maturity, but Seth Anderson, what I see in him is adding a little bit of maturity to the wide receiving core, too. Even as a young guy, he – comes in and there's this air of confidence about him that he knows he's not looked at as Caleb Brown is supposedly the, the savior of the offense, which I don't want to put that on Caleb Brown. That's, that's not coming from me, but he's a guy who's been there, done that at the college football level. He's the son of flipper and flipper Anderson, who of course a, a very talented NFL wide receiver. And he's a guy who can make plays. And we saw it on kids day. We've seen it at Charleston Southern. I don't think he's going to be the guy that you look to to return punts or kicks or anything like that, but he's a possession wide receiver who's, I think, got higher top end speed than a guy like Nico Ragagini. I think he's more of a guy that can make those, you know, quote unquote, spectacular catches than a guy like Nico. Um, and he has that experience to him. There was a conversation that uh, I actually started on on Twitter and within our our premium board on, on iowa.rivals.com. It was, has Seth Anderson become underrated? At this point, because people were excited when he came in and then Caleb Brown was added to the roster and it seems like everybody kind of forgot about Seth Anderson. Um, people talk about or the coaching staff really talks about Nico. They really talk about Deontay because they're known commodities. The fan base really talks about Caleb and then Seth kind of got swept under the rug. And then he got back, uh, excuse me, brought back into the conversation at Kids Day. And I think he's going to be a regular contributor to the offense. Now he's on the depth chart. And I, I think he's got this quiet confidence about him that he expects to make plays as well. So I, I think he's become underrated by way of the addition of Caleb. But I do expect him to make plays this fall. And I think he's 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 going to. He, he, he's, he's a solid football player. Again, I'll encourage everybody to go watch the the – preview release with coach Patterson earlier today. One thing he said that I thought was interesting. I've heard him say it before, Mark, but he brought up Hayden Fry and, and as it relates to talent on the football field, Hayden Fry was a believer in bloodlines. And that's one thing that Seth Anderson has his great bloodlines. I mean, Elliot brought up his dad who has the all, you know, single, t single game receiving record in the NFL. Um, he's got good athleticism, good speed, 
Here's the other part of why I think people may be selling him short a bit right now. Not only the Caleb, the Caleb Brown thing, you're absolutely right, Elliot. That that commitment kind of overshadowed Seth, which I don't think is bad for Seth. Take the pressure off the kid. But I think it kind of overshadowed him. The other part of it was, let's not forget, Seth was not priority one prior to Caleb Brown. It was Isaac Tesla who ended up going to, to Arkansas. So he's kind of been, I don't know, he's kind of played second fiddle in the hearts and minds of Hawkeye fans since since the transfer portal cycle began, but you're absolutely right. Great ad. And the fact that they've been healthy now, I haven't heard anything. Maybe you have Elliot. I have not heard anything on Jacob Bostic. He is the one scholarship receiver that I've been told is, is out still. Is that consistent with what you've heard? Yeah. He, I mean, he was like, you said, I mean, he was on the sideline at kids day and it's, it's been consistent that, that he hasn't been, been practicing is, is, is what I've heard. But they've got, I mean, again, you're talking probably your top five guys. Um, and I'm, I'm, when I say five, I'm adding Alec Wick in there because I think he's probably number five given his experience. Um, your top five guys are healthy heading into game week, we, ex- we suspect. Um, and so anyways, um, yeah, Utah State is a dangerous go, – go ahead, Elliot. I was just going to say one thing on, on the wide receiving core. Uh, a player that I don't think – a lot of people recognized at kids day that I wouldn't say made a ton of plays or anything would be Dayton Howard. I was watching him pretty closely during warmups. And when I was talking to Jacob at, at media day, I was talking to him about the potential of being that go up and get it receiver because they don't have that in those top four guys. They're all six foot or shorter. If I'm remembering correctly, I think it's Raggy Eni, uh, Deontay Vines and Kay- or, uh and, um, and uh, yeah. Seth Anderson are all six foot and Caleb Brown's five ten, So they don't have that go up and get a receiver. I was talking to Jacob about being that guy. Potentially he said, I said something about him being the tallest of, of that group. And he said, yeah, I used to be until we brought this guy in and points in at points at Dayton and Dayton was making some pretty solid catches uh, during warmups. I don't know. I don't know if you had your eyes on him at all, but um, he's a, he's a guy that I think flew under the radar in terms of recruiting and you could think? very well be, <laughs> <laughs> he had, he, he had went zero. Uh, uh, he had no other offers. I mean, no other. Okay, he went under the <laughs> NIA. I mean, he didn't even get an offer from Mark to be on this show. I mean, he was totally. A, <laughs> that's not even. He wasn't anywhere near a radar. Okay, he went under the radar. All right. <laughs> um, this is before my time when he got when he got uh, picked up by Iowa. But anyway, um, he went under the radar in, in terms of recruiting, and I think he could not necessarily be that guy this season. I, I wouldn't put that sort of expectation on him to be that go up and get it receiver. But if he's called upon, I think he could make some plays, and and especially in the absence of Jacob Bostic and in the need of a, a go up and get it receiver because Eric Hall wasn't called on to do that at Michigan. Luke Lachey obviously brought up brought up into more of a um, a playmaking role this last season. But if you really want to go up and get it receiver. Uh, and, and you need it now. Maybe, maybe we see Dayton Howard get get some get some snaps this year. Do, do I think he's going to be you know a, a, a double digit catch guy this year? Do I think he's going to definitely get more than those four games? I don't. But he's a guy to watch, you know. And and I, I really did like what I saw from him. And I, I I have high expectations in the future, you know, not immediately for Jerry at Bowie too. I, I liked what I saw from him as well. So maybe Alec Wick isn't in that fifth spot. Maybe he is. Maybe he's not. One thing, uh, Mark, I'll be open about being wrong about things. I the the one freshman receiver that I kind of had pegged as a guy who I thought might be able to come in and help them right away was Alex Moda, the one guy that doesn't get talked about anymore. <laughs> and was he even out there at Kids Day? I don't think he was. Was he running out at Kids Day? I know he was at maybe media, I, media day, but uh, but yeah, you're right. Bowie Bowie looked good at times. Howard's got th- this class. I've talked to a lot of people about this. This class is unique in that it is physically a gifted class with a lot of guys who flew under the radar. You brought up Dayton Howard at six foot five. No other offers known to man. Um, and so yeah, I mean, I know the staff was high on him heading into the summer, and he seems to be a guy. It, look, if, if they lose a guy or two, like I know we kind of chuckle about Jack Johnson. Jack Johnson played a little bit last year as a walk on because they were decimated by injury. So that's one less body they have walk on or not. And so you never know. They, they could. Uh, and, and I wouldn't be surprised. You talk about the four game rule. Here's a game against Utah State. If they can build a lead and get to the fourth quarter, man, I'm getting those receivers some time. 
I'm getting Deacon out there. I'm getting Cade out of there. Um, I want Cade to play, Mark. I, I think the people that say Cade needs to set out week one to protect the court, like that's just, he hasn't played in an Iowa uniform. He needs to be out there. <laughs> you got 12 games in the season. He needs to be out there if he's healthy, as long as he's not at major risk of injury or injuring his And I'm all for him being done by the end of the third quarter. Now, that's traditionally not a move that Iowa makes with their quarterbacks. They lead their quarterbacks in, I think, way too long. Um, even with Spencer Petras, remember when he was playing at like, well, you, you don't remember this, Elliot, because you were covering the beat. He was playing at 3 a.m. last year against Nevada while they were up 27 to zero. And I'm like, what is going on here? Let's get somebody else in the game. But anyways, uh, I think you get him out of Dodge. You, you, you uh, get him out of Dodge at the end of the third if you're up by three or four scores and see if, you, especially if you're running the ball well and just let those running backs eat. Um, and obviously you rotate guys and figure out your rotation. I think that's my biggest key for Saturday, Mark, is creating an early lead to where you're not forcing, you're not forcing things heading into the fourth. Fourth can the fourth quarter of a game like this should be somewhat of a comfortable 15 minute period where Iowa can experiment in a real game situation, not against themselves, where they can get Deacon Hill some snaps maybe even get Marco Linez some snaps or Joe Labus, whoever's healthy, you know, get Jazz Patterson in there, get Terrell Washington in there, get those freshman receivers in there, right? Like these are the games you do that in. You got this game in, in Western Michigan and every other one's a, a power five contest. So I know that uh, some of that judgment is kind of like, what is the feel of the game? But some of it's just a flat out point total. So what kind of lead is Iowa going to need going into the fourth quarter <sighs> If you're coaching the team to get some guys on the bench, Kate in particular, and with, with the defense being as good as it is, obviously that's that's should factor into the decision. Heading into the fourth 15 minute period, uh, I think it probably needs to be four scores. I know that sounds like a lot, but I'm just going by history. Like I said, Iowa was up 27 nothing on Nevada, and and Spencer Petrus was still, you know, still <laughs> still going up under center. So. Elliot, do you have a thought on that? How big the lead needs to be? To well, first off, uh, what I was going to say is uh, it should be the case that they're able to do that in the fourth quarter. It should be the case. Will it be the case? Like I said, that's it's a not question. A, not a typical move for <laughs> Iowa, and we don't know with the transfer portal and everything. I mean, Utah State, Kirk. I'll say this: Kirk was very respectful of Utah State today in front of the camera, and he was very respectful of Utah State behind closed doors when he met with Don Patterson last week. That's the one thing I'll say from his discussion with Don. He is not being, uh, what's, what's the word? He's not being disingenuous when he said, when he compliments that coaching staff, they did win 11 games two years ago. So who's to say they don't bounce back Mark. If they can go from 11 wins two years ago to six wins last year, who's to say they can't go back to 10 or 11 wins this year. This game to me has 23 to seven written all over it. If, if it's 23 to seven, we're, unfortunately, we're not going to probably see a lot of the young guys. And that's an unfortunate, I, I, I know that's not how Kirk looks at this thing. And it goes back to the, his philosophy on offensive football and, and whatever we need to do to get a win. He, he made the comment today about one of his favorite wins of all time was the six to four win against Penn State. And this is one of the things, Mark, we haven't gotten a chance to talk about yet. Um, but you were really kind of annoyed by, by some of his comments today regarding how you how he judges the offensive coordinator position. It didn't bother me, Mark, because I'm so used to hearing it, and I'm so focused, honed in on week one right now that it's just like, a, whatever, Kirk. I don't. Do I agree with him? No. Do I agree with him making comments like, you know, we're we're I'm going to look at the offensive coordinator by by means of how many wins he's a, a helpful or in or accountable for. No, but uh, uh, you know, I've heard this for so long. Elliot's new to this. Look at it. Look, look at Elliot. He looks like a uh, he looks like this just innocent little puppy dog over here because he's he hasn't been ex he hasn't been exposed to this yet but we've been experiencing this for the length of brian ference's tenure especially over the last two years it's it just is what it is anymore did you have thoughts on that elliot did you i mean have, have you how much have you been exposed to this given the fact that you know you you haven't been on the, the iowa beat for a real long time now right uh I guess exposed to spec specify exposed to what exactly exposed to Kirk. I mean, it seems like every opportunity that Kirk has, and I love Kirk Ferentz. I mean, I'll, I'll be quite a great guy, uh, and you you've seen that already covering the beat. But 
every opportunity he's had, even since the backlash at the end of last season due to the second straight year of more than pitiful offense led by his son, every opportunity Kirk has had to still kind of deflect away from Brian's responsibility and accountability, he has had taken every opportunity to do that. I love Kirk, but he's just, he has not taken, he has never once said, this offense needs to get better. Brian needs to be a better coach. He's never once said that. I mean, yeah. he, he he groups everything together, and I, that's where people like Mark, you're going to be frustrated. I just don't want to spend a lot of time talking about it because it's we, we won, to. and we it, spent so much time hey, talking about it. You know, I'm talking about this stuff, not just Iowa, but for 35 hours a week yeah. or whatever. Somebody made a comment to me yesterday about uh, jumping into a conversation. I'm like, you don't realize I got 15 channels. I can do live streams all night if I want to. I can talk at length about whatever I want. So I, I can shoot some separate video ranting about the ridiculous response to that. Whoever the reporter was, he he got on a good topic. He just didn't present it in the right way, but he was basically getting to the point that if you're in situations like, and he drilled down to particular situations, specific situations, game situations last year, to say, what are you basically going to do in these situations, knowing that there's a 25-point standard per game, and here was the situation against Wisconsin, and this is what you did. Here was the uh, situation, and he pointed out another game, and and here's what you did. Uh, He didn't present it really clearly, and Kirk obviously dismissed it and then went into his whole spiel about how his wife said, if you just win, that's all that matters, and she said that 40 years ago. Well, the team went seven and five in the regular season. It's not like they're setting wins records. You know, I can respect the winning percentage of Kirk and that that he's won consistently, but he is one, meaning you have a winning record. Is that what he's defining winning as? If they were winning national championships and winning every game three to two, I'd say, you know what? You've mastered the system. I give up. You're right. You're winning Big Ten and national championships three to two every game. Fine. But that's not the case. Why, why is going seven and five in the year before going 10 and two in the regular season and eight and four most of the time? Why is that winning? We win. The, what I thought you were, you made the comment before we went live here, Mark. The fallacy, there's a, a plenty of fallacy, I think, in, in what Kirk says I think part of it is his philosophy what he believes in and then it's influenced it's only it's only uh, embellished by the fact the dynamic of who the offensive coordinator is relative to Kirk we understand that but I think the other part of this is what you said prior to going live on the air it's unfair in that they're not evaluating Specifically, I'll say defensive players that way. One could make the argument that they sort of stuck to that motto with Spencer Petrus because I I think even though Kirk would acknowledge that the quarterback gets way too much credit when a team wins, way too much blame when they lose, that's something Don Patterson has said many a time. We saw him put together pitiful performance after pitiful pitiful performance after the last over the last three years and yet he continued to start part of that's because the room wasn't very strong but i guarantee you and we've seen it from phil parker if one of his corners breaks down on a play or two he's out he's done at least for for that series for that game whatever the case may be and so those players are not being evaluated based on how many wins the team is getting so why would specific position coaches and specific coordinators be evaluated based on wins. I have said many a time, Mark, that I have no problem with evaluating Kirk as a whole based on wins. He's the head coach. I mean, that's, that's the ultimate metric that we're going to look at, but don't do that for your coordinators. Don't do that for your assistant coaches. Like if the run game is, if they get negative 10 yards per game this year, but they win nine games, are we, well, Adele, Adele Betts is getting the job done. I mean, come on, let's use common sense here. So, there's my rant, Mark. You, yes. you happy? You got me into a rant. Well, by using the same standard, do they confront the defensive unit after they lost to Illinois last year, nine to six, didn't give up a touchdown, lose nine to six, and say, you failed? 
This was a failure. No, you're responsible. Of course not. That's Again, the same standard. <laughs> I know, but it's it's the dynamic, the the unique dynamic that is the coaching staff, and part of it is philosophy. I think part of it's dynamic. I, there's no other way I can explain it. Before we cut Elliot loose on this topic or whatever, Elliot, you want to take off on, I'll say this one last thing, because again, I can go on and on about this. Uh, I, I've, I've laid it out this, this way, Elliot, and um, Corey can take a nap for about 20 seconds because he's heard this a zillion times. But if you own a company and you've got three divisions, follow me, like offense, defense, special teams, but yours is like technology, uh, you know sales and then you know accounting and the accounting and the technology are airtight elite but nobody goes out and sells the product so your company fails or fails a percentage of the time 30 hey maybe 30 or 35 percent of the time your company fails because you're not selling the product your sales department sucks that's fine that's good we're not going to talk to them or deal with them because we're so strong in these other two to departments that they carry the company and so we won't address that <laughs> just nobody looks yeah. at it from that regard well here's here's how i look at it gentlemen it so last year when i was on the beat northern iowa beat i was also hosting a radio show that was just generally iowa because you can't just host a radio show that covers the uni panthers you just can't there's not a big enough fan base uh it was called corn stocks and sports talk thank you very much i came up with that myself and so i had to cover iowa a, a little bit in that regard um wrote about them a little bit online as well and because the majority of my energy was focused on you and i i just kind of had to laugh at the situation and not think about it too much and that's kind of what it's translated to now here as well I, I remember covering the first presser that i i did uh with with rivals and kirk saying i don't anticipate any changes into our staff and just laughing like and like listening to games and hearing uh how uh how the offense was was uh operating and because uh, i was driving up to, to cedar falls to, to cover a game i listened to to the learfield broadcast and you know, nobody else, op I, I want to say nobody else operates that way. I mean, when you place, when you're 130th out of 131 teams in offense, you just can't continue to operate that way. Unless you're Kirk Ferentz, unless you're in Iowa City, unless you've had the success you've had. So, but, but again, Kirk does I, not, met, his metric is not total offense. He's made that very clear. He right. doesn't care about that. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's the whole point. Exactly. That means nothing to him. Exactly. He cares about yeah, wins. So that's, that's, that's just it. So... And and he's right to an extent, Mark. If they go eleven and one, and their offense sucks, and they go to the playoff and they win a national title, I mean, I'm still gonna. First of all, that's not gonna happen if they have a, a, a putrid offense. They they're gonna have to be at least to, to win 10, 11 games. I think they're gonna have to. They did it a couple of years ago with a hundred twenty third ranked offense. I think they're gonna have to at least be a top seventy five offense to have a chance to win the Big Ten. But anyway, I have a ton of respect for Kirk Ferentz. What he's achieved there, his stability, continuity, all the other things. He knows so much more about football than I do. But I guarantee that if we pulled aside or didn't even pull aside, if we asked in public at news conferences of the other 10 worst offenses in America and asked those coaches at UMass, New Mexico State, whomever they are, is your offensive performance, is this suitable? Is this you know, what you're striving for. Is it acceptable? They would say, no, they would say, we need to get so much better on offense. We need to do this. We need to do that. We need to do this. Yeah. We need to be much better. Well, they Kirk would all Fer say that. Let me just, let me just come into his defense a little bit. He's never said it was acceptable. He's never said the offense is acceptable. That's what I'm saying. Like he's instead of just uh, outwardly accepting how bad it was and saying this, we were bad. We need to be better. He hasn't done that, but he also has not done the opposite. Like he, he doesn't, he, he kind of just goes round about and in general, he generalizes everything, right? Everything comes down to how we're performing as a team. Did the offense do what it needed to do that day? I think if you ask Kirk, the offense did what it needed to do when they won six to four against Penn state 20 years ago, the offense did what it needed to do a year ago, Mark, when they won seven to three due to two safeties against South Dakota State. So that I'm just saying that's how he 
evaluates it. Would I like as an Iowa guy and an inner fan in me, would I like to be able to hear him say, yes, uh, Brian's my son, but he's not getting the job done right now. And yeah, there's some pressure on him. Absolutely. He's not going to do that. That's just not how he works. He, he's also got to go home to Mary. That's the other part of this. <laughs> I know I've said that before and people kind of laugh at it, but I'm serious about that. So as I've said, Elliot, you have heard me say this before. I just want Kirk to stay, or I just want Brian to stay out of Cade's way this year. And that's why Cade's health is so important because if Cade gets hurt, okay, now we're turning to a guy who couldn't even crap the cra- crap, couldn't even crack <laughs> Freudian slip, couldn't even <laughs> crack the depth chart at Wisconsin, which was led by who was their quarterback last year that was terrible? Mark? Graham Mertz. Mertz. Graham, Graham Mertz, Mertz, who's now at Florida. But my point is, he couldn't even crack the depth chart at Wisconsin. Uh, and that's who Iowa fans are putting faith in. Uh, an offense led by Brian Ferentz and Deacon Hill. Watch out. Cade's, Cade's health is so, so important. And I think that if – I do believe this. This is one thing I'll say. I do think Brian – or I'd like to think Brian is self-aware enough to not get in his way. And I'm not saying like he's just going to sit down while Cade calls all the plays on Saturdays, but I'm just saying for the most part, um, I, I do think that this staff has a lot of confidence in Cade McNamara and they recognize what he brings from Michigan and his expertise, his experience. Um, does the quad, the soft tissue injury worry me? Absolutely. Uh, do you worry about getting re-aggravated? Absolutely. Um, those things like they don't go away. It's not like, three weeks into the year, we're going to say, Oh, he's hundred percent healed. Like that could, he could re aggravate that two months from now. They could be undefeated heading into November, Mark. And all of a sudden Cade scrambles and you know, he falls down again. And just like that, you're done. So you're going to be holding, if you're an Iowa fan, you should be holding your breath all year long. Um, my guess is for Utah state, they are going to, assuming he plays really tr- urge him to stay in the pocket as much as possible. Um, even though I know he's not Robert Griffin the third, he is much more mobile than Spencer Petrus and Nate Stanley ever were. Uh, I don't think we're going to be seeing a whole lot of scrambling from Cade McNamara. So we'll get a. This will be a nice audition for this offensive line because <laughs> if he's not scrambling uh, and he's taking hits, that that doesn't do any any benefit to the the cause for health for for Cade McNamara. Any final words, Eric? I don't know that we, uh, Elliot, I'm sorry, that we need to go anywhere else um, with this conversation. Do you guys have anything else? I'm good. I need to ask, <laughs> we, before we let, we've had him on, I appreciate you hanging out with us for the last hour. Elliot. You probably got some some phlegm to cough up. But uh, anyways, that wasn't the point. <laughs> anyways, so we we need to ask you about recruiting, though, because you do, you do rec- cover the recruiting beat um, much better than I do. And, and, uh, you mentioned some recruiting stuff before we jumped live on the air. Um, where are we at right now? First question I want to ask you, and then I'll kind of throw it to you, kind of give us a general idea of the focus right now, of the staff and where they're focusing their attention. But I, I, one of the big topics I've had with Kirk, with Kirk, with Mark and people on the show regarding the 24 class is how much Iowa has dominated the state of Iowa. And of course you're so in, you've been, tuned in to in-state recruiting even when you were at you and i is am i blowing that out of proportion or is it almost obscene how much iowa has handed it to iowa state for this class of 2024 within the state of iowa well i i tell you what the the first name that you have to bring up when you look at the 2024 class isn't tied to Iowa or Iowa State, and that's Grant Bricks. And he's probably going to end up at either Nebraska or Kansas State based on what I've heard, the intel that I've got. Um, so probably take him off the table initially. And then and then it's Cody Fox because there's only two four-stars in the state of Iowa, at least according to rivals to this point. I'm going to go watch Derek Weisskopf this weekend as uh, they take on Saint, uh, 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 Xavier. I think I mentioned that at the top of the show. And to me, everything that I've seen – lends itself to him eventually becoming a four-star as well. Just that sheer athleticism, what he's able to do on both sides of the field. And I think if he doesn't end up on a, as a four-star on rivals, first of all, I have no influence on that. Anybody coming to me asking why I I don't do it. It's our, it's our national guys. It's our regional guys. 
I'm, I can have, I guess I do can, I, I can have some influence. I can talk to them, share my thoughts, but ultimately at the end of the day, I don't determine the star ratings. Now I'm going to go watch him this Friday. If it stands out to me, like I expected to, I'll talk to our regional guys. I do think he's going to end up a, a, a four star and he at least at the very least should be a four star. That means two of the three, four stars in the state of Iowa, which Iowa doesn't generally end up putting guys out that are four and five star recruits. Caden Proctor, Xavier Wampa, these guys are anomalies. I mean, you're going to get Nick Brooks next year as well. There's, I, it's not often that they churn out these four and five star guys. And Iowa's going to get two of them in state, two of the top three recruits. And then you go down the list, and and ours is a little bit different than some of the other outlets. Uh, you get five, six, seven in Carson Brune, Keaton Roscop, and Connor Moberly, and they're going to either Iowa State or to Kansas. Cam Buffington in there as well as number four. And when you look down the remainder of the list, I think it's six of the top ten from the state of Iowa are going to go to Iowa, and two of the top ten are going to Iowa State. So it's in this not a class. It's it's not quite as. Uh, it's not quite as obscene as like what you, your, your, your rival site two, four, seven, they've got, I think sure. Iowa, like 10 of the top 12 and Iowa state's nowhere. They don't have a guy in the top 12 at last, last look. Right. And, and for rivals, then you look at the top 15 as, as a whole, and you've got Brevin Dahl, Preston Reese, and, and that's it, I guess I, I my apologies, but, um, Brevin Dahl and, and, and Preston Reese in there. And I think Brevin Dahl is criminally underrated on our site as well. I, I He's agree. a 5.5 three-star. I think he should be at least a 5.7 three-star, that fringe three, four-star spot, because he's just a playmaker. He's a guy that you put the ball in his hands. He's a threat to score every time he touches yep. the ball. It's it's similar to when I think of the 2025 class. Unfortunately, he just released that he's out for the year. Zay Robinson, not quite that electric type of playmaker and electric type of athlete, but Brevin Dahl, is more or less that that type of playmaker in that class. And so I, I think he should be a, a top top 10, maybe top five guy in, in the class. And then you look at Drew Campbell, who has that versatility. He told me that they might see him as an offensive lineman at Iowa. As a, Yeah. I have not heard that. Straight from his mouth. He's told me that twice. Um, it it kind of depends on how he develops and how he grows. But generally, when I look at him, I think linebacker, I think edge. That's probably what he's going to end up as, but there's a possibility depending on how he develops that he could be an offensive lineman at Iowa. So, so Elliot, you, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Mark. I thought you were done there. I was just going to ask you out of that list of players in the state of Iowa, how many of them are Iowa Hawkeye level players, big 10 level players in your estimation? Uh, that have committed to Iowa or of that just that in regards 15. to the, you know, if you look at the rivals list out of the top 15 to 20 players in the state, like how many of those players are worthy of playing at a place like Iowa, that there should be an evaluation to that number to say, okay, Iowa grabbed this many out of this many. They probably sure. aren't looking past this number. Probably around 15, right? Is that fair? Maybe of the not. 15? No, no, no. Well, I was say, prob there's probably 15 power five guys in that class within the state of Iowa, right? Yes. So all of these guys that are, that are in the top 15 are going to play power five. Yeah. Now, it, it's also dependent on where they got other players from. Like they didn't offer Connor Moberly a scholarship because they had already gotten James Reeser. Now, they didn't offer Jacob Simpson a scholarship because they wanted – somebody else. They went out and got, got Gavin Hoffman. They went out and got Michael Burt. So I, I wouldn't necessarily evaluate it as, oh, they missed on these guys. Well, they didn't offer them a scholarship. You know, if, if, if they saw it as a miss, they would have previously offered them a scholarship. I mean, you look at the rankings here, they did offer Grant Bricks, but they ended up full on the offensive line. So I wouldn't necessarily count that as a miss. Had he committed earlier, it would have been a win, but I think that they see him not quite. They don't evaluate him as highly as some of these uh, recruiting services do. And then Carson Brune, I, I don't believe they offered him a scholarship either. Keaton Roskop didn't offer him a scholarship. Um, you, you go down the line, Kyle Rakers, Jake Peters, Drew Miller didn't offer him scholarships. So it, it, it's it's a, a situation where maybe some schools did see him as power five. Maybe some schools didn't. 
it's it's a multivariate thing, right? I mean, I, I think people just in general like to look at things as black and white, and it's just not black and white in this circumstance. Either they didn't offer them, or they already got their their full at a certain position, or maybe they did miss. But it, it based on this top fifteen in the state of Iowa, I don't feel like the staff feels like they missed. Well, Drew Miller, that that one's kind of a unique one because right, I. Uh, you know, and and what I was told is is they they basically just refused to offer kickers and punters prior to uh, seeing them at specialist camp. So I I that that one was frustrating. I know a lot of Iowa fans because ended up he committed what to Georgia. So Georgia, you know, it's just how you prioritize positions in the football field, right? And he's the top kicker in the in the country, top punter in the country, I should say. Um, so. So where, what is Iowa? I mean, this is what I have to realize. I know people are probably like, what are we talking about recruiting week one? High school football just started. So we're right back. I mean, like the recruiting doesn't stop. And I, I know um, I would just offered a, a kid here about less than a week ago. Um, and Leroy they're, they're, Roker. Yep. Roker. And so t- what's their focus right now? What are they still looking for? Um, I mean, 23, 24, there's gonna there's a possibility for some late ads there but i mean that cl- class that group is looking pretty pretty locked up i should say at this point the 24 class is narrowly done now the first thing that i want to say here is you still have to keep recruiting even though you've gotten them to commit because right. We've seen what happened last year. Caden Proctor flips on signing day, right? You you don't want a repeat of that. So you have to, and especially just generally looking at the landscape of college football and the recruiting scene, kids flip. It's just happening now. It's just happening. So you have to continue to recruit. But if you look at it from a grand scheme of things, these guys, um, you you assume they're going to stick to their commitment. There's only a few spots left in this, in this 2024 class. And that's at wide receiver and that's at defensive back. Now, they've got K.J. Parker and Reese Vanderzee at wide receiver. I think those are two great ads. K.J. Parker is a playmaker. Reese Vanderzee is that quintessential go-up-and-get-it receiver that we talked about a little bit. He's coming out of Central Lion, a smaller school. So, you know, there's no there's no guarantees in recruiting, period, but there's no guarantees, especially when you're getting those small-town kids. Cooper DeGene might have something else to say about that, but – as, as I'm saying, there's no there's no guarantee when it comes to those small small town kids. But I do like Reese Vanderzee a lot. I think he's I think he's a talented kid. Um, and, and I think what happens there is they're they're gunning for for Jaquan Reed. As far as I can tell, he's got his his official visit set up for September 16th. I'd imagine he's there. I believe he's uh, there. I was there's only power five offer. So it looks like he's going to be their their uh, their guy at, at that third wide receiver spot. And then you look at defensive back. And they're probably going to add either one or two more on top of Jalen Watson and um, Rashad Godfrey, uh, Rashad Godfrey out of Florida, Jalen Watson now out of out of Ohio and uh, Leroy Roker. He's the, the kid that they recently offered also out of Florida, very under the radar. His only other offer is South Dakota. I just recently talked to him the other night. As far as I know, no other schools are showing interest. That could definitely change. They will now. That could definitely, yes, right. Well, when Iowa that, offers a, a DB that, yeah, the other schools will call Exactly. Yeah. That's the number one thing. The second thing is in his first game of the season, he had one reception for a 70-yard touchdown and two interceptions. One would have been a pick six, but it was called back because of a penalty. So the kid's a playmaker. He's long. He plays running back on top of playing defensive back, so you know he's got that agility as well. Um, and he's a smart kid. I, I, I talked with him the other night. He is very high on Iowa. Um, and, and so uh, uh, I'm not positive that, that it shakes out in, in Iowa's favor, but I, I would say he's leaning Iowa currently. Um, and, and then isn't he going to be, a, he's going to be at the game this weekend. Roker. Isn't he? Or who, who did I see was going to be at the game? There, there's somebody going to be at the game this weekend. Um, I should have had that written down before we went on here. Uh, go ahead with what you're. I'll find it. Go ahead. My understanding is that Roker's going to take his official visit in October or November. Okay. Um, he said during a bye week, but they don't have a bye week in October, so we'll see how that shakes out. But then, 
Additionally, there's Casey Etienne, who's another Florida DB um, that plans to take a, an official this season. He hasn't gotten it set in stone yet. But other than that, they're really narrowing down who they want in this class. They're really narrowing down who they want, who their priorities are, and they're just kind of gradually going to go with offering bit by bit as long as Oops. We may have lost Elliot. Hopefully not. Um, but oh, there he is. Where did I cut off? Sorry. I, I thought I lost you guys too. Just about Maybe. five to 10 seconds ago. So. Okay. So from what I can tell, they're narrowing down who they want in this class at the wide receiver and, and DB spot and really, really honing in on these specific players. And I mean, as we saw with Xavier Lucas, who just committed to Wisconsin, he ended up choosing the Badgers. And so they moved on, they offered Leroy Roker. And so they're, they're going in that direction. And I imagine it'll be an increment by increment sort of approach as the season goes on. And as this recruiting cycle continues, um, whether or not Leroy Roker decides to commit, but I, I know they're very happy with what they've got to this point. Um, and, and so the 2024 class could very well be wrapped up pretty soon and we could be moving on to 2025 as they've already got a commit in in 2025 in, in Joey Van Wetzinga from from uh, Pleasant Valley brother of of Rusty Van Wetzinga who's a who's a walk on and a fullback and on that 2D on that, that 2D just... yeah yeah I don't know what I was I, I I'll have to find that I don't know what I was I saw someone uh, report something about somebody who's going to be somebody I thought it was going to be at the game this weekend and then at the game against Iowa State oh it's uh Thomas Meyer, t t class of 25. Yeah. I'm sorry. There are I had that a couple off. other guys that are going to be there this weekend as well. Um, Nick Brooks is expected to be there. Big Will offensive Thompson, lineman Will, from Will Kennedy. Will Tompkins. Tompkins, yep, from Cedar Falls as well. Um, those are those are names that I have confirmed. I haven't confirmed anybody else to this point. But Yeah, so um, anyways, uh, I, I appreciate your your expertise. You're following where these guys are. Uh, do you, do you uh, I'm just curious, do you track their sleep schedule? And do you track their uh, when they go to the bathroom and when they eat supper? And <laughs> I always joke to Mark no. about how the recruiting guys, <laughs> not necessarily because you want to, but the recruiting guys now with social media, you guys are forced to like track every which every little thing they do. <laughs> do you enjoy that oh, about yeah, your dude. job or what? <laughs> you know, it, it's it's interesting. It's a different dynamic that I've never experienced before. Um, to quote one of the other guys that are that are in the industry, you're just kind of always on, you know, I mean, I was I was just on vacation this last weekend to, to get a, get away a little bit before the season started. And when I had time to check my phone, I, I had to check my phone, you know, um, had to had to check the, the connections, check Twitter, see how things are going with with a variety of guys, <laughs> check their offers because you got to update offers. You got to update visits. This is all in their profiles. It's it's intense, man. And it's three sixty five every single day yeah well mark i appreciate uh, elliot jumping on with us absolutely this, this afternoon great stuff fun everybody yeah, thanks for having out, me on uh, guys i appreciate it everybody check out uh, elliot's work elliot clough at uh, iowa rivals so please check out what he's got going any any particular articles or anything that you've released uh in specifically um, we got that article out on on Leroy Roker. If you want to check that out, you can be, uh, be a, a subscriber today, iowa.rivals.com backslash subscribe if you're not already. We got great content on our premium boards. We engage with our subscribers there. You get all that info, that inside information um, and, and quotes from these guys before anybody else. You get the information. I dropped my... 24 seven has the crystal ball, which is great marketing. We have future casts. So um, you get all my future casts there, guys who I expect to be Hawkeyes or otherwise. And I share those on the board. So uh, you, you get great information before anybody else does. Um, I may have dropped a future cast recently for a, a member of the 2024 class in favor of Iowa. So that that's something you can check out definitely right now. Um, and this week coming up here, I will have an article on, on guys who I'm going to go watch this weekend, other players, uh, to be, to, to, to have an eye on. And I always drop little nuggets when I get them. I'm, I'm talking to recruits every single weekend. Um, when I go out and watch them and, uh, I, I, I am not tracking their sleep schedule, but I'm doing everything as, as possibly close <laughs> as I can to that. Thank you, Corey, for that. But um, <laughs> yes, we got we got great stuff uh, on the site. Of course, Adam Jacoby, Ross Binder, they're 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 on the the beat as well from from our site. So um, 
enjoying every minute of it, working really hard and, and uh, hopefully bringing you the content that, that you uh, so desire. We so much appreciate Elliot, you stopping by great stuff on recruiting and week one against Utah state. You are welcome back anytime and uh, enjoy the game. Enjoy the heat or stay cool as, as is possible. I guess it's going to be more possible for you than it is for Corey uh, on Saturday. It's okay. I love, yeah. I love the heat. I'm just, I'm, I'm more so concerned about the players. I, I don't, I don't mind the heat whatsoever. I just uh, wish they would let us bring you guys, you know, be up in the press box, you can do whatever you want, but I wish they would let fans bring in drinks. I, I know that's, I don't know, it's probably a discussion for a different day and there's safety and all this nonsense. What, what I've always found almost humorous about the security at these types of events is they're not like they're frisking you. They don't allow you to bring in drinks, but they don't frisk a person. A person could bring in so much, you know, and that's, that's kind of a scary thing. But anyways, I hope that they make something available. I don't know what they'll have. Maybe they'll have some cooling fans in the, the uh, breezeways in the corners of the stadium on Saturday, but either way, um, Elliot, I'm sure he'll have uh, plenty from, from Friday with high school football. And then, of course, uh, they'll have plenty of stuff Saturday. I'll have post game show with Don Saturday, Mark. Um, I'll be at the game, so there'll be a bit of a, a, a gap there after the game, probably no longer than an hour uh, following the game. And uh, we'll be taking people's calls. And, uh, yeah, we'll get into another year of Iowa post game with Coach Patterson. So that'll be fun. Absolutely. So, Check out uh, Elliot's work, everyone. Corey and Coach Patterson on Saturday after the game, a few hours after the game. Be looking for those notifications. And then we'll do it uh, right back here uh, next Tuesday at 4.30 Central. And we've got a Nebraska show coming up here in just a few minutes over on the Huskers channel. Elliot, we appreciate it. Have a uh, good time this weekend. Thanks, guys. Appreciate you having me. Yeah, so I think that's uh, pretty much it. But we want to make sure that uh, everyone, you're thinking like two to three hours after the game that you'll be firing up the uh, post. No, I think it'll be closer to an hour. Oh, okay. it'll be closer to an hour. Um, so uh, and it'll probably be we usually go what two to three hours. <laughs> so I'll be anxious to see what it's like. I'll be anxious to see what it's like on Saturday. Um, I'm I'm just excited to get back into Kinnick. I mean, we were in Kinnick. I've been in Kinnick several times here recently due to Media Day and Kids Day and the spring game. But like. It's going to be nice to be able to be back there, even though it's going to be extremely hot. Um, and uh, look forward to seeing Coach Patterson again. Like I said, the preview's out right now for people who want to check that out. And tune in tomorrow night on my channel from the Hawkeye of the Storm for a live show with uh, Brad Heinrichs of the Swarm. He's one of the biggest Hawkeye fans out there, and he's doing a lot of good work for, for this program and this athletics department. So I'll be anxious to talk to him. We'll get kind of an insight on on uh, his relationship with Beth Getz, interim AD Beth Getz. That'll be an interesting conversation with Brad. And uh, yeah, plenty of stuff. Multiple videos dropping every day this week on the channel. All right. Very good. Uh, Huskers in Minnesota, huge game in the Big Ten Western Division to kick off uh, week one on Thursday night. So we're going to talk Minnesota and Nebraska here in just a few minutes over on the Nebraska channel at the Voice of College Football. All right, Corey, uh, enjoy the game on Saturday. We'll talk to you during Cyhawk Week. Thanks.